It's my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Tamika Nunley, who is Associate Professor of American History at Oberlin College. Where's William Vaudre? <laughs> I figured he'd be singing the school anthem by now or something, but anyways. I will if you insist, but I don't want to cut into the good professor's time. <laughs> okay, well, maybe at the end we can wrap up with that, okay? It's called 10,000 Strong. I really think you'd enjoy it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, I've been looking forward to it. Um, anyways, uh, Dr. Nunley and I have been communicating off and on, as she indicated, for over a year. Um, and I am really happy to have her here because it makes me look really good because this is Women's History Month. As I indicated, uh, and those of you who have been president know what it's like trying to line people. I was able to contact her and she said, well, I'm unavailable in March. So, <laughs> so we really lucked out. Um, if you saw the website, you saw uh, the many uh, uh, credentials and accolades that she's received, uh, but she is an expert in uh, teaching about slavery, gender, 19th century legal history, digital history, and amazing, and interestingly enough, the American Civil War. Um, she is a local, I was gonna use some gender thing, but I, I guess I better not, but she is a, <laughs> if I remember correctly, Euclid, uh, Euclid High School, and is gonna come home to roost, it sounds like, mm -hmm. after a side trip to Cornell and the University of Virginia to do her graduate work, um, and uh, still lives in the Cleveland area. So uh, we're really happy about that, to have somebody like her with us. Um, and I have probably botched this beyond belief, but it's really nice to have you with us. And before I forget, because I will, I want to remind everybody, if you would like to buy her book at the Threshold of Liberty, you can go to the Cleveland Civil War Roundtable <laughs> and you will see links that you can click on and go uh, to Amazon and purchase her book. And a little bit of the proceeds will come back to our group. But uh, as we usually are able to let people, you know, buy books at the at the meetings, we thought this would be a great thing. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nunley and say thank you very much for being with us. And uh, it's, we'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a it's a joy to be here. Um, I um I, so I, I love studying the Civil War for a variety of reasons. Um, so the first is um, my family has um, served in the, in, in the US military in every um, engagement since the Civil War. Um, and so my brother, he recently fought in Iraq and I have um, some of my ancestors also fought in the American Civil War. My dad's a soldier, my sister's a soldier. Um, and so, um, uh, coming to the study of the Civil War felt uh, like the right thing uh, to do. Um, the other thing is I've had wonderful mentors that are way more, um, that you've probably read, uh, you know, more than, than my work. Um, Gary Gallagher and um, Elizabeth Barron um, trained me as, long, as well as the Volia Glimp. And so a lot of my work um, is kind of an outpouring of that, um, that training. Um, I love uh, visiting battlefields when I can as well. I did a 90 mile bike ride through um, Gettys uh, Gettysburg, through the Shenandoah, and then um, to Antietam and through Harper's Ferry. And so um, we could talk about that too um, after uh, or during Q and A. Um, and then I teach um, an advanced Civil War seminar, um, Civil War era seminar that has some of the most cutting edge scholarship. Um, and books on the Civil War. And then I teach the general Civil War and Reconstruction course um, at Oberlin too. So there's lots of uh, things that we can talk about uh, in the Q&A after the presentation. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you today is I'm gonna share with you um, some parts of my book that focus on um, wartime emancipation in Washington, DC, which happens in 1862. Um, I tried to pick parts of the book that I thought would be most relevant to the round table. Um, and so um, there are other parts, there are chapters on um, prostitution during the Civil War, there are chapters 
based on schools. Um, and so um, the book has a, a sort of wide range of topics, but today I'm going to focus on what emancipation actually looks like, because that's actually what inspired me to write the book, um, was this question, this question we've been asking in Civil War scholarship of um, who freed the slaves? Right. Um, this is a question that lots of people like Chandra Manning um, and Kate Mazur and others have been trying uh, to grapple with. So um, I'm going to share um, some slides, as you can see um, on the um, on the front page. I should also add that I have ordered some book plates. Um, so if you do end up buying the book and would like um, like me to sign and send you a book plate, you can just shoot me an email and because you're local. I live in Cleveland Heights. So just, you know, since you're local, it's so easy for me to send it to you if you would be interested in. Um, and so uh, just let me know. And then I just want to double check. Can everybody hear me okay? We're all set. All right, because we're going to get ready to roll. Okay. In 1862, Congress enacted the District of Columbia Emancipation Act to abolish slavery and the slave trade in the nation's capital. For Black Washington, the years of waiting for Congress to exercise such power ended at the beginning of the Civil War, in spite of arguments against the constitutionality of local emancipation. With the exodus of a strong contingent of Democrats following Abraham Lincoln's election, the Republican dominated legislative body passed the measure with votes at 29 to 13 in the Senate and 92 to 38 in the House. Although the bill passed by a significant margin, the opposing votes underscore an underlying truth about this era. I just lost my presentation. All right, there you go. <laughs> Historically, white Americans expressed hostility toward the idea of black liberty in both antebellum and wartime shifts toward, towards emancipation. Scholars have pointed to the rehearsals of gradual emancipations in the North and prevailing attitudes against racial equality. While many Americans embraced the prospect of ridding themselves of slavery, the manifestations of black women's self-making in times of emancipation placed them at odds with dissenters who expressed concerns over equality or quote unquote amalgamation or citizenship. This sentiment rang true for white locals in Civil War Washington. The landmark DC Emancipation Bill made provisions for compensation to slaveholders to the tune of $300, along with a financial incentive set at $100 for former slaves to relocate to another country. Still, even as some African Americans entertained the possibility of colonization, they decisively charted their course in the Union and remained in the capital. Accordingly, this marked the moment that white locals in Washington dreaded most. It might appear that the struggle for liberty ended with local emancipa emancipation, but Washington was the citadel of the Union, and what applied to those enslaved in the city in 1862 sent signals to enslaved people and slaveholders alike throughout the geographic region. For most of the country, slavery and the fugitive slave law prevailed, but slaveholders still felt threatened by what they saw happening in Washington. When Congress legally authorized the emancipation of a population of roughly 3,000 or so people, countless others took advantage of the measure. White Washingtonians braced themselves for a tidal wave of refugees. Black women, both refugees and recently freed, recognized an important opportunity. Throughout the course of the war, refugee women and freed women arrived in the nation's capital with intentions to be free and to define for themselves what life would look like. This was not a new pattern, however, since wars prior to the Civil War inspired flight and claims to liberty. Whereas the incentives for emancipation in previous conflicts emphasized leverage against foreign foes, the legal measures deployed by Republicans were designed to undermine states in rebellion, although Confederate views of themselves as sovereign could mean that they too were foreign. As the war progressed, soldiers, officials, and legislators, empowered by martial law and legislation, helped usher in the process of emancipation. This constituted both a measure of strategic advantage and inconvenience as they often managed more crowds of refugees than their camps could accommodate. The revolutionary legal transformations of the war marked Union lines, and the capital in particular, as key sites of power and significance. 
The perilous journey bond women and children made to these sites both inspired and tested the effectiveness of these policies. We learn from them the limits of government, the violence that comes with monumental societal shifts, and the idea of liberty as a powerful motivator for navigating such turbulent terrain. But first, we must begin with the story of the nation's founding and its dependence on slavery to understand the political climate of wartime Washington. Charting the varied pathways that Black women pursued gives us a sense of the possibilities of their worlds. And in my new book, At the Threshold of Liberty, the story begins with a woman named Suki. On August 16, 1821, Thomas Tingey, Commandant of the Washington Navy Yard, placed a notice in the Daily National Intelligencer of a slave's escape in Washington, D.C. Earlier that week, Surrey, an enslaved woman he owned, walked out of the kitchen in his residence and beyond the wharf into the residential area of the district and did not return. By the time the advertisement appeared, Surrey had become Suki Dean, a fugitive within the nation's capital and a free black woman available for hire. Tenji explained in the notice that Suri had changed her name to Suki Dean and that she most likely continued to seek employment as a domestic with the local family after having fled the home of one employer when she learned Tenji had discovered her whereabouts. At this point, Suki Dean disappeared from the available historical record and yet Suri was henceforth Suki, the person she had envisioned, fashioned, and named prior to her escape that summer of 1821. According to census records, Suki had been with the Tenji household at least since 1790 when the family resided in Philadelphia. By the time of her escape, she was one of six enslaved people forced to serve the Tenji household. Suki's frequent appearance in family correspondence reveals a history of everyday defiance, and more specifically, her plans to wield her own authority over her life. Her escape was the culmination of that history. Tenji's wife, Margaret, had threatened to sell her just before they moved to Washington, D.C. According to Margaret, Suki declared her opposition to the move, quote, I won't go anywhere but where I chose a master and you cannot oblige me, end quote. Suki stayed with the family for 20 more years before she decided to leave. Perhaps she decided to remain for 20 years because she was also raised in Civil War. We know that Suki bore children within the Tenji household. We know very little, however, about their lives, the condition of life and work in the household, their social networks within the district, or whether or not they remained with the Tenjis after Suki left. What is clear is that their mother maintained very specific ideas about her desired life, identity, and work environment. Suki's own assertions about her choices and obligations developed decades before she escaped. At the Threshold of Liberty tells the story of women like Suki, African-American women who made extraordinary claims to liberty in the nation's capital in ways that reveal how they dare to imagine different lives. Self-making as it appears in the actions of African-American women help us to consider the possibilities of self-definition, even if Black women never acted upon these visions in the form of resistance. For instance, Suki's decisions allow us to recognize the manner in which enslaved women plotted, dreamed, imagined, and created ideas about themselves, as well as the people they knew and the places in which they lived, decades prior to any evidence of resistance. In other words, Suki confirms for us the very existence and palpability of Black women's sense of self in ways that make this less a story about resistance and more about what it means to assign meaning to and understand the possibilities of their worlds. This is not to undermine the power of resistance. Indeed, this entire book rests on the evidence of resistance to explore the definitions of possibilities of self-definition. But what if our conversation is about how women of African descent navigated life in the face of a society built upon the bondage and exploitation of Black women? Do continuities of survival exist to help us understand how African-American women survived the afterlives of slavery? So then what does it mean to define and preserve a sense of self in a society that supported a very narrow definition of what it meant to be a Black woman? This process of self-definition or invention required strategic navigation of the District of Columbia, its institutions, local labor economy, laws, communities, and neighboring counties. 
Here, I use the term navigation to understand the ways African-American women responded to the conditions of slavery, fugitivity, freedom, and refuge. Both the physical and figurative navigation of the capital required an understanding of its laws, customs, and the people that shaped Black women's everyday encounters and experiences. Even in instances where women strategically and carefully navigated life in the capital, they faced a significant degree of unpredictability. In other words, this is not a journey to or through a promised land or a triumphal narrative. The conditions they experienced were rooted in what Cedric Robinson termed racial capitalism and the conversation about the relationship between slavery and capitalism and the persistent subjugation of black people in American labor economies. The strategies of navigation and invention that African-American women employed manifested under conditions of bondage, freedom and legal emancipation. Acknowledging the presence of racial capitalism underscores the unfinished work of liberty in and out of slavery. Similarly, Sadia Hartman complicates our national discourses about the egalitarian possibilities of self-making to help us think through the ways individual autonomy leaves the work of addressing inequality to African-Americans. A constant thread in the story of these women who experienced various degrees of freedom and unfreedom from the formation of the Capitol to the American Civil War is the premise that the struggle for liberty remained incomplete. The efforts of these women to search for work, freedom, education, income, and citizenship exposes a persistent tension between the racial and gendered underpinnings of capitalism and the limits of liberalism. Liberty then is a term conceptualized and reconstituted again and again by African-American women in ways that push against the limits of Western liberal democracy. Black women's early 19th century experiences of invention and navigation reveal how they created and sustained a constant tension between bondage and the possibilities for liberty. This tension reflected the ways Black women actively exposed the contradictions between slavery and the governing ideals of the nation. The realities of race and gender-based repression were at odds with Black women's desires for freedom, for the freedom to decide how and with whom they would live their lives. These clashes confounded the symbolism of Washington, D.C., as the young country took center stage as an emblem of liberty. The conflicts waged by Black women occurred anywhere from the intimate realms of households and schools to the public, very public realm of the courts, streets, and governments in ways that intensified over the course of the Civil War era. By the beginning of the Civil War, Black women appealed to local government agencies to verify the reach and application of new emancipation laws. Moreover, Black women's actions during the war were novel to the degree that emancipation legislation positioned them to appeal directly to the federal government. But as Suki's story reminds us, wartime emancipation, however, did not mark the beginning of Black women's liberty claims. And once they became fugitives, refugees, or legally free, what happens next? On December 16, 1862, Emmeline Wedge filed petitions on behalf of herself, her two children, and her sister Alice Thomas, who were all enslaved on the property belonging to Alexander McCormick. McCormick refused to take advantage of the compensation provision of the new emancipation law the year it took effect in Washington, D.C. He reluctantly appeared before the clerk of the court after receipt of a summons. According to court records, McCormick, quote, denied the constitutionality of the Emancipation Act and said that he would bide his time until it was declared unconstitutional, end quote. Besides, he was a citizen with rights to property, and why would anyone take seriously claims made by an enslaved woman? Just before his case was decided, McCormick reappeared before the clerk and commissioners of the district, and for the first time, formally contended with the liberty claims of Emmeline Wedge. In this case, emancipation threatened the property rights of slaveholders and excluded white residents more generally from any democratic processes that decided the fate of slavery in Washington. Ideas about liberty and bondage were inextricably tied to place and Washington was changing. African-American women like Wedge assumed a new role, not completely carved out for them, but with anticipation and even hope for what could be. Throughout the course of wartime emancipation, refugee women and freed women navigated the power dynamics that made liberty possible in order to secure it for themselves and their kin. 
Former Bond women employed their knowledge of the geographic and political significance of Washington as they approached officials of the government to make claims to liberty. These experiences were distinctive in how they transformed their own futures, as well as the significance of the nation's capital as a site of liberty. For these women, liberty was the work of self-making. Refugee women who arrived in the capital during the Civil War did so at their own risk, confronting a system in which their legal status was deeply ambiguous. Refugee and fugitive women took advantage of the geographic and political position of Washington, D.C., particularly in instances when they arrived from slaveholding states um, during or after 1862. Many of them traveled to the district from Virginia, a bastion of the Confederacy, or Maryland, a loyal slaveholding state. According to the laws and customs of the Confederacy, Black women coming from Virginia were con considered fugitives and depending on one's views, refugees. With Virginia in rebellion, officials might be less sympathetic to Virginia slaveholders, but an enslaved woman could never be sure. The intra-regional ties were strong and locals with Southern sympathies likely undermined Black women's liberty claims if given the opportunity. Concerned with appeasing loyalists in Maryland, the federal government legally protected the interests of slaveholders in the state by upholding the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Depending on whether the laws of the Confederacy or the Union applied, Black women traveling from slaveholding states could be considered enslaved even as wartime emancipation took its course. Thus, Black women remained in a state of legal limbo as they navigated wartime policy created in the interests of states loyal to the Union and against the interests of the Confederacy. As emancipation unfolded, white locals resented the blatant absence of any democratic processes with regard to such significant matters and subsequently petitioned in protest. Slaveholders represented a small population of the district, but the loss of property value and the inability to claim the total value associated with enslaved people forced the government into a position to decide whether to prioritize the claims of white slaveholders, the freedom of bond people, or strategic advantage in the war. With regard to property, American law not only inscribed racial identity on property with the legality of African slavery, but as Cheryl Harris argues in her work, whiteness developed into a spe specific form of property affirmed by the law. In the moment of wartime emancipation, Black women with the legal backing of the Union government disrupted this property interest in whiteness, even if momentarily diverting a centuries-long pattern of white expectations of power over Black Americans. These measures, however, were also about the shifting tides of war and the implications for wartime emancipation more broadly. Thus, the government demanded that white locals take the deal and prioritize the interests of the Union and its military policies regarding enslaved people. Although the bill offered comp compensation, white residents begrudgingly conceded to a union government that violated a long-standing social contract with white men. Amid protests, as many as 966 slaveholders filed claims for compensation for enslaved people freed by the Emancipation Law. The clerk and board of commissioners, along with the secretary of treasury, were responsible for assessing the claims, determining the value of slaves, and transacting compensation. Commissioner records indicate that the majority of the claims involved smaller slave holdings, ranging between one to eight slaves. For the value of four slaves, which included an enslaved woman named Rosanna and her children, William and Alexa Gordon, and Caroline Lucas, the infamous brothel owner, Mary Ann Hall, requested $3,000. According to Hall, Rosanna alone was valued at $1,200. White women appeared as frequently as men in seeking compensation for their property. A woman named Harriet White, for instance, requested a little over $6,800 for the value of 24 slaves. White's case was one of many filed by white women hoping to profit from the compensation provision of the law, revealing that both white men and women were financially invested in slavery and believed they were entitled to compensation. Some locals possessed holdings as large, if not larger than whites. District resident George Washington Young, for instance, boasted holdings of 68 slaves with an attested compensa compensation value set at over $17,000. Slaveholders in Washington generally either took advantage of the compensation provision made for emancipation or questioned the constitutionality of the new legal measure altogether. 
white possession of black people as they understood the practice was permitted by the law and protected by the Fifth Amendment. Particularly for a state like Maryland, slaveholders felt entitled to protections of their property rights, regardless of how events unfolded in the district. Compensation did not amount to the full value that an enslaved person might command in the antebellum market, and the provision could never replace the power to exercise full discretion over the decision to free them. Slaveholding and non-slaveholding whites feared that the hierarchies that shaped society were being undone by such measures but this was an assumption that black women could only hope for. The geopolitical borders of the Chesapeake could either undermine or work in favor of black women's navigation of wartime transformations. The facts of Emmeline Wedge's case reveal the unique geographic position of Washington DC and the neighboring Chesapeake counties as a distinctive geopolitical battleground over liberty during the Civil War. As an enslaved woman, Wedge challenged both the legal validity of her enslavement and forced McCormick to contend with her testimony against him. The Supplemental Act passed in the summer of 1862 permitted enslaved women in the District of Columbia to testify against white men and women for the first time. Regarding the actual case, evidence showed that McCormick's farm was located along the border dividing the district from Maryland and that just one day after the Emancipation Act became law, he instructed the slaves to reside on the Maryland side of his property. According to the records of the Board of Commissioners, he built a small tenement for them on the Maryland side, while his main living quarters remained in the district, along with the cow pen and other buildings included on the homestead. While McCormick generally prohibited enslaved people from traveling to the district side of the property, it was proven that Alice was, quote, required to drive cattle from the pasture to the cow pen, end quote, which was located on the district side. Unidentified witnesses also testified that they had seen the women and children in McCormick's Washington home daily, and that for approximately seven or eight weeks, Emmeline and her family had resided in the district with an older man also bearing the last name Wedge, who was identified as the father of Emmeline's husband. The Board of Commissioners ultimately acknowledged Emmeline's right to claim freedom under the Emancipation Act of 1862. Emmeline's case is illuminating because among other things, Emmeline's husband and father-in-law did not file the petition, but she instead took the initiative to make her own liberty claims. But this was not unusual. In her work on gender and the political dynamics of reconstruction, Laura Edwards argues that, quote, African-American and common white women formed a loud, visible, and vigorous public presence both during and after the Civil War, end quote. Patriarchy did not always feature prominently in Black women's quests for self-making or liberty. To the contrary, freed women in the moment of local emancipation filed numerous claims and complaints on behalf of themselves and members of their families initiating the transition of entire families into liberty rather than wait on the authority of men to do so. Early understandings of citizenship rested largely on the imperatives of the patriarchal head of the household to uphold the rights and obligations of citizenship. Free black men often made the argument that discrimination denied them the recognition necessary to fulfill their duties as heads of their households and as formal political citizens. Indeed, white women and free African-Americans found ways to participate in associational and community-centered forms of citizenship in the absence of more formal privileges of citizenship, such as the vote. For refugee women, patriarchy at times proved inapplicable or irrelevant, and Black women found alternative expressions of their position in society or were not tied to any men at all. Nevertheless, patriarchy factored into outcomes in emancipation petitions, depending on the commissioners and bureau agents involved. Throughout the course of the war, Black women litigated, petitioned, and organized in the capital. The legal and extra-legal steps they took to realize liberty set in motion an array of claims to their lives and labors that challenged their racial and gendered exclusion. In many cases, officials from the Board of Commissioners, Union Military, and Freedmen's Bureau assisted enslaved women in their efforts to be free, to find kin or employment leads. White locals also deployed a variety of strategies to prevent Black women and men from realizing a life of freedom and equality. Former owners like McCormick attempted to evade new emancipation measures by claiming residence in loyal slaveholding states. Others employed violence or harassment to reinstate control over the lives of Black women. 
Slaveholding and non-slaveholding whites in the district and surrounding Chesapeake counties made it clear that they would not simply acquiesce to the terms of emancipation. In fact, the government still wavered on what the afterlife of emancipation might look like for refugees and existing Black residents. After the Emancipation Bill passed, Black residents either remained in the district or left for other cities, but the law also included provisions for a government subsidized immigration initiative. A longtime proponent of colonization, President Abraham Lincoln met with a delegation of Black leaders during the summer of 1862 to discuss the possibility of encouraging Black people in the district to leave the country. He made a point to express the potential for Liberia and especially Central America as potential sites for relocation. Liberia, founded in 1822 by the American Colonization Society, Haiti and Cherokee, a, reg a region in New Granada, were among the places under consideration for Black settlements. Founded in 1816, the American Colonization Society held their first meeting in Washington and over the years led several initiatives for Black immigration to Liberia and Haiti. Moreover, Black proponents of emigration also entertained the possibility of colonizing specific locations in Central America as early as 1854. While immigration gained support from a minority of, free, of the free Black population, enthusiasts continued to fuel ongoing efforts to fund colonization. In fact, in 1864, 150 African Americans had made plans to board a vessel headed to Haiti from Alexandria, uh, Virginia. Discourses around immigration were certainly not new and did not inspire wholesale rejection from Black leaders. The delegation that met with Lincoln included Black leaders with established roots and residents in the capital who founded the district's oldest Black churches and intellectual societies. Among them were John F. Cook, um, John Coston, Edward Thomas, Cornelius Clark, and Benjamin McCoy. These men descended from an established tradition of civic, intellectual, religious, and anti-slavery activism in Washington, D.C. They were not the Black men that would most likely be directly impacted by the emancipation measure, but they could be driven out by colonization. The Black leaders, however, possessed the influence to convince Black Americans in the district that emigra emigration could encompass the beginnings of a promising new era of Black liberation. During the meeting, Lincoln remarked that, quote, without the presence of Black people, a civil war proved unnecessary. Careful not to overlook the obvious fact that people of African descent arrived in the country through brutal force, he also acknowledged that slavery was the greatest wrong inflicted upon any people. He believed that Black people should live where they are treated best and argued that it is better for both races to be separated. Lincoln pleaded further stating, quote, you may believe you can live in Washington or elsewhere in the United States the remainder of your life, perhaps more so than you can in any foreign country. And hence, you may come to the conclusion that you have nothing to do with the idea of going to a foreign country. This is, I speak in no unkind sense, an extremely selfish view of the case, end quote. Lincoln tried to convince the delegation that the greatest service to Black people, particularly those to, new to freedom, involved relocation to a place free from white prejudice. This was an attempt to appeal to their leadership and influence among Black Washingtonians. He went further to explain the appeal of Cherokee, a place rich with natural coal deposits that Black people could extract to generate profit from exports. He also emphasized the strategic location of the colony and duly noted Central America's close proximity to the North American mainland as opposed to Liberia. With Lincoln's strong endorsement of the scheme, Congress appropriated $600,000 towards colonization. Black leaders such as Henry McNeil Turner, Joseph Williams, and Delegate Edward Thomas supported the idea initially and encouraged people to remain open to the possibility. Such support represented one of many expressions of Black desires for independence and self-determination. But the majority of Black Washingtonians, however, remained hopeful that liberty on American soil might appear on the horizon. Wartime emancipation symbolized an important victory for Black Washington, as well as white abolitionists, but it was clear that Congress and the president encouraged their exodus. Although such colonization efforts had gained some traction prior to the war, the government could not convince a critical mass to emigrate outside of the country after emancipation, nor could they convince white people to affirm the idea of Black equality and citizenship on American soil. 
African Americans articulated visions of birthright citizenship long before the outbreak of war, and refugee women and freed women asserted their right to remain in the district when emancipation took effect. They did not see themselves as citizens of a foreign land. Their labors, struggles, and loyalties had fostered a sense of belonging in North America. Over a year since emancipation took effect, Black women continued to pursue freedom and carve out a life within the Union. The logistical challenges of realizing liberty, even towards the end of the Civil War, can be seen in the experiences of parents who wish to rescue children yeah. from slavery. In the absence of testimony from parents and guardians, orphans' courts enacted judgments that supported apprenticeship rather than full emancipation. The judges administered parental authority as parents searched for children, attempted to claim guardianship rights, or faced threats and intim intimidation from former owners. Although the labors of all household members were critical to the subsistence of families during the 19th century, local justices in the orphan's court often refused to acknowledge the rights of black parents to protect the labor of their children. In many instances, slaveholders hoped to entice parents to remain on the farms by withholding children. As a result, black women sometimes took matters into their own hands in order to retrieve their children from the grips of planter exploitation and to create a life where their families could enjoy the fruits of their own labors. Jane Camper, a former bondwoman, reportedly told her former owner of, quote, my having become free and desired my master to give my children and my bedclothes, and he told me that I was free, but that my children should be bound to him, end quote. She testified further that, quote, he locked my children up so that I could not find them. I afterwards got my children by stealth, end quote. Camper, like many other freed women, risked her life to save her children by stealth from un unconsented apprenticeship. She concluded her statement saying, quote, my master pursued me to the boat to get possession of my children, but I hid them in the boat, end quote. As Camper's story reveals, the union government made the freedom of black women and children lawful, but not always tangible. Even upon assuming freedom rights gained from the war, black women continued to the work of resituating their relationship between themselves, the government, and the communities in which they lived. Black institutions such as churches and relief societies generated the momentum necessary for raising funds and collecting material goods that black families needed in the district. Black women founded a number of organizations available to refugee women. Elizabeth Keckley, which is pictured here, organized the Contraband Relief Association with Black women who attended 15th Street Presbyterian Church. She felt inspired to take action upon, quote, seeing and hearing of the sufferings of the contrabands who are sent to Washington, and subsequently proposed to some of her lady friends when returning from church one Sabbath day, the necessity of a contraband relief society, end quote. Keckley explained that the Contraband Relief Association was formed for the purpose, not only of relieving the wants of destitute people, but also to sympathize with and advise them. Keckley made appeals in the black press and explained that we need for them food, clothing, and money. We have now several invalid families of women and children under our care for whose house rent, fuel, and medical attendance we are obliged to expend money, end quote. With the assistance of Northern benefactors, as well as prominent women, such as Mary Todd Lincoln, Keckley reported that, quote, we have visited and counseled them, and we have, as far as we have the ability, relieved their wants by giving them food, clothing, and medicine, end quote. There were a number of societies devoted to the aid and relief of refugees and freed people, many specifically devoted to women and girls. The financial contributions of Northern philanthropists made transportation and admission into industrial schools possible for young Black girls. Congress approved the incorporation of the National Association for the Relief of Destitute Colored Women and Children. According to the Bureau agent, they emphasized the, quote, training for virtuous citizenship, many outcast children, end quote. The association focused on raising funds and providing basic necessities and instruction and moral improvement. Even as the government shut down bureau operations in 1872 and withdrew military support in former slaveholding states in the late 1870s, the National Association for the Relief of Destitute Colored Women and Children continued operations into the 20th century. By the late 19th century, during the nadir of anti-Black violence and repression, a vibrant social and political movement of Black women's activism appeared at the forefront of the nation's capital.
This activist tradition among Black women in the district originated with the claims that enslaved and free Black women made much earlier at the conception of the nation's capital. From the very beginning, the processes of self-making led Black women to imagine and at various intervals realize visions for liberty. Black women continued well after the American Civil War to forge a social contract with the federal government. The Union government altered the possibilities for liberty through legislation, but the women discussed here put those policies to the test before, during, and after the Civil War. The chances of becoming free were greater where the Union wielded authority and corresponding officials acted in accordance with the legal measures. But even under these circumstances, refugee and fugitive women were not shielded from abuse and violent backlash. Black women and men, as well as government officials, employed the term citizen to describe free African Americans and refugees at the moment of wartime emancipation. But overstating this fact, however, wrongly suggests that all white unionists extended to refugees an invitation to share equally in the rights of American citizenship. Republican support and military authorization of emancipation do not always translate in the lives of Black women. White acceptance of emancipation was shaped by place, borders, and factors tied to local customs. While some locals rejected slavery, they also resisted the notion of Black equality just the same. Liberty came with a set of expectations articulated by freed women who made claims to their lives, their labor, and families in ways that made them equal contenders for the legal protections afforded by the union government. Thus, white Americans no longer possessed sole access to legal recourse and rights. The imperatives of liberty for black for both black and white people respectively were at odds and that the property rights of one violated the liberty rights of another. Government officials too struggled with the adjustment that wartime policies called for. Just as lawmakers within the halls of Congress and the soldiers at union camps observed the new radical measures that came with emancipation, they also employed terms such as contraband or dependent to describe the refugees they encountered. These terms rhetorically are antithetical to 19th century ideas about citizenship. The emphasis on the actions of union authorities often obscures freed women's struggles to define the terms of their inclusion. The process of realizing and navigating liberty reflected a more collaborative than patronizing process. This doesn't mean that they didn't appeal to soldiers, federal authorities, or even call upon 19th century gender norms. They strategically navigated a changing government and society to help make legislation a reality for themselves. Black women challenged the notion that liberty stopped at legal emancipation. Using tactics such as flight and appeals and petitions to the government, Black women found kin, shelter, food, jobs, and support for survival. These were the strategies deployed to set up the foundations for self-making. The actions of enslaved women like Emmeline, refugees like Jane Camper, and free women such as Elizabeth Keckley set in motion a dynamic that positioned Black women to confront white resistance and appropriate various channels of recourse recognized by the union government. Thank you. Aha, uh -huh. I have unmuted myself. Thank you very much. We will take questions, please. Um, uh, let us know either by raising your hand or the chat. Um, and we have a first question from Dan Zeiser um, regarding the concept of liberty being somewhat fluid in, in the first half of the 19th century. Did it mean something uh, legal? or something more? And could you comment on that, please? I love that question. That's a fantastic question. Um, I think it meant something more than legal for these women, right? I think there's legal freedom and emancipation, which is absolutely important to them. But I think what, um, you know, I use this term racial capitalism to try to understand why freedom is so precarious after the Civil War. And it's because that sort of all-encompassing sense of liberty that one has the right to um, to their own livelihood, to their labor, right, to the fruits of their labor um, are still issues that are not resolved by legal emancipation. And so these women are seeking out 
um, aspirations for liberty that involve them being economically independent, that allow them to access the rights that everyone else gets to access um, in local, state, and national governments, um, but to live autonomous lives, right? And to not be um, subjected to sort of a very narrow set of options. So in the book, I talk about how, you know, once these people become free, what's next? And this is why I have a chapter on prostitution because there's not a lot of options, right? You're either working in a role that's very similar to slavery or, you know, you're entrepreneurial, right? And some of the most lucrative entrepreneurial ventures are that of sex work at the time, which is not illegal um, at, during the mid 19th century, right? It's just seen as socially, you know, taboo, but it's not legally, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with, with prostitution. And so um, there's a very narrow set of options. And so to the degree that you see African Americans in history books that are able to own property, um, to, you know, build a, uh, a sort of a financial legacy for their children, to be able to go become educated, it actually becomes, that's actually quite exceptional because that's not where the majority of African Americans are uh, during this time period. Thank you for that, that question, that was great. Okay, we have some more questions coming in under chat and I am going to ask uh, Andrew Mangles or somebody, is there another way people can raise their hands because I forget. But uh, we've got one from William Vaudre who wants to know if you came across any references to Oberlin type people involvement in the Freedmen's Bureau in the course of your research. Oh yes, definitely. Oberlin is always very involved in the uh, mid 19th century, um, you know, all the way from John Brown to, <laughs> to the Civil War. Um, and there are many connections actually before the Civil War where um, Oberlin uh, graduates or members of the Oberlin community target the nation's capital to help with fugitive slave escapes um, throughout um, the region. Um, but they are definitely targeting the capital during the war to volunteer to provide relief and aid um, to refugees and also to soldiers during the war. Terrific. We've got a question from Stephen Krauss mm -hmm. at length about the efforts of African American women to make their emancipation actual through the legal system. To what extent was their success in these cases um, the same or different than those of African American mm -hmm. men? You know, it, it really depends on where they're located. So for DC, um, because um, the Freedmen's Bureau has a respected presence in the um, Chesapeake area, um, you find that they are sort of more, they're able to more successfully advocate um, for themselves because of their proximity to local government institutions that have already, you know, sort of, they know the brief of legal and wartime emancipation and they're following it. Um, but it becomes challenging in other parts of the South um, where the union government presence is not as strong, right? And so, this is why I frame it as a collaborative process, right? It takes for these women to leave the plantations, right? And risk their lives to try to find union lines or to try to find DC. Um, but once that happens, um, they are able um, to um, secure some reprieve or some advocacy. Um, but the sheer numbers and logistical feat of refugees coming in, there's some 40,000 refugees coming into DC, um, which is enormous, right? And so the government does not have the capacity uh, to, to address all of those concerns. And that's where you see the phenomenon of poverty, right? Um, disease, um, extreme deprivation, and also, um, these military camps being filled with a lot of these refugees who are then put to work um, on um, uh, different different labor initiatives of the military. Um, but then that's why you also have a, a huge increase in prostitution as well, um, because they're not quite able to locate jobs where they can be hired, where you know, they can earn a living to, to feed their bellies. And so um, there are all kinds of logistical challenges, but I do think once chances are greater, 
if they are in uh, closer proximity to the nation's capital, um, because there are more established Black institutions of free Black folks who have been free for a while, who can help them um, navigate um, sort of the government bureaucracy um, that, that's involved with, with legal emancipation. Um, for men, um, many of the um, Black men are trying to join the, um, the army. Right, and so they're looking for union. They're looking for actual um, military lines. They're trying to put their put themselves to use um, because they have a broader trajectory in mind, and that's that of making claims to citizenship, right, and equal inclusion into into the union. I have another question from William Vaudrey, a fellow Oberliner. Mm -hmm. Uh, he says, "I seem to recall Frederick Douglass concluding that Lincoln had moved away from his enthusiasm for." by the end of his life, would you agree? Did, he moved away from what? I'm, I missed that. His enthusiasm for colonization. He did, he absolutely did. And you know, one thing, you know, I try to remind my students, it's important uh, like any other human being to see Abraham Lincoln as an evolving person, right? Um, who, who, um, whose mind changes and that's okay, right? You know, we don't, we don't have to kind of stick to the 1840s and 50s of his political discourse, but we can understand the ways in which war can have a profound um, transformative effect on how people are understanding and envisioning what the nation is going to be. Um, and he definitely, after, after that meeting with the delegates, you know, that I discussed in the lecture, um, he is really convinced, you know what, I, I wanted to give it a last shot, but these folks are, you know, these folks are willing to not only to be here, they know the risks, um, but they're willing to do the work as well um, to, to help make this a reality, right? And I think that Lincoln, um, Lincoln sees that, right? Um, and so um, I definitely think his views, his views change um, in terms of how he sees African-Americans fitting in sort of the broad, broader republic, right? Terrific. Uh, I'll mention that uh, right now everybody's sending questions in on chat. Oh, okay. You to do that. I'll read them for you. Okay. Uh, I asked if, uh, Andrew, is there a way that uh, if they want to ask a question, they can do the hold up your hand in Zoom, or is that another app? Well, I mean, I think it's easy. If, if they want to ask it directly, just uh, put in the chat, I'd like to ask a question because there's multiple screens of people. So okay. it require kind of flipping back and forth to see if somebody has a hand up. Okay. But if somebody wants to ask oh, a question a directly, up. that's okay. Well, I'm going to take Mark Porter's question next because it's been sitting there for a while. <laughs> this is to you, Dr. Nunley, and he says, your family includes a number that have served in the military. Did any of these serve in the Union Army or Navy? And I'm going to edit that on one of my um, things that I've been on, and that is my ancestors did not serve in the Union Army. They served in the United States Army. So the question <laughs> is, did your serve in the U.S. Army or Navy during the war for the rebellion. Yes, they did. They served in the United States Army um, a, as well. So yeah, definitely. What okay. unit? What unit? You know what? We're still trying to locate the unit. We only have their portrait in uniform. Um, and so we're trying to locate um, where where they, and there's, there's, the problem is, is that the person has um, a lot of people have that name, right? Um, it's David Kennedy. And so lots of people have this name. <laughs> and so trying to locate which one in the USCT, um, you know, um, uh, 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 Kennedy it is, is, is really hard, but we have a portrait of him in his union uniform. Um, okay. Has been a part of our family reunion uh, display every year. <laughs> Do you have it handy, doctor? Could you show that to us? You know what? Um, I don't have it handy um, on me right now, um, but uh, but yeah, let's see. I, I don't know. If I'll tell you what. If you can, uh, if you can uh, scan it and send it to us, we'll put it on our website. Oh, Absolutely. that would be great! Oh, my family would love that. Terrific. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to. Um, let's see. Amen. One twenty three out there, <laughs> and we know who you are. Uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, I'm a uh, 1950 graduate of Oberlin. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> That's amazing. Took a, took a U.S. history class probably in the late 40s. Wasn't well, wasn't well, class. Tell before. her who you tell her who you are. <laughs> uh, Maynard Bauer. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, I wanted your reaction. Uh, I when I took the test in the U.S. history class at Oberlin, I knew on the basis of the textbook and some of the lectures. The correct answer to the question, although I sort of disagreed with it at the time, and the question was, what was the major cause of the Civil War? And the correct answer at that time was a high tariff. Oh, really? <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, in the um, naturalization exam, there's two answers. Um, so I don't think, I don't even think the federal government is is uh, decided on this either <laughs> in the, in the, um, in the uh, naturalization exam for the for the nation, um, you could say states' rights or you could say slavery, um, and and so that's something that's still hotly hotly debated, right? And the problem is that they're so interconnected, right? Um, and so you can, in, in a lot of ways, say say both. <laughs> but yeah, that is I, I I would have never imagined a tariff. That's <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, we have a question from Dan Zeiser. I want to get into. Uh, do you have a favorite story that did not make it into your book? Ooh, um, no, my favorite stories made it into the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll share a favorite story um, that didn't, um, yeah, I didn't share in the presentation. Um, so there was this woman named Alethea Browning Tanner, who was enslaved in, um, in Alexandria, I believe with, um, to the, she was enslaved in the Custis family. Um, and she earned, she had her own garden plot, um, developed her own um, sort of surplus of local sort of garden, garden uh, produce and took it to the market. Her owner allowed her to go to the market and sell it. Um, and eventually she became so successful that she was able to purchase her freedom. And then she ended up purchasing, you know, five family members as well. Um, and those fa five family members became one of some of the most important educators in, in DC um, throughout the 19th century. But then I went and looked at some church records and I saw her name in some of the church records and she helped found some of the churches. And um, they wanted their own brick and mortar church. Um, and there were not a lot of people who had a lot of money, but she ended up being the second highest donor um, and a Bible study leader um, in, in that church. And um, that church is still standing today. It's called 15th Street Presbyterian Church and it's humongous. <laughs> and, um, but to me, that is, when I talk about self-making, and the aspirations for liberty. Um, she captures the spirit of that in ways that I think are quite remarkable. And, um, and her level of generosity um, was just, just tremendous. Um, and to have that kind of vision to create these autonomous, you know, independent institutions, you know, to take care of refugees later on in the Civil War. I mean, it just, you see her legacy um, live on even today in Black DC. And so she's one of my favorite people to talk about. Great. Judge Connolly, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question and make your comment? Um, good evening. Uh, I wanted to find out, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm historically correct. Uh, was not Benjamin Wade and John Sherman from Ohio uh, instrumental in the passage of the um, Emancipation Bill for DC? Yeah, they were, absolutely. Okay, then we'll have invite you down to the Cuyahoga County Soldiers and Sailors Monument where they, where they are pictured there with a free slave. So I'd like to oh, offer awesome. you that invitation and we'll arrange it uh, in the next month or so. Oh, awesome. Or you can join in next month and we will be giving a lecture <laughs> on the... <laughs> Oddly enough, Judge Connolly just happens to be what, uh, assistant chairman there or something like that? Yes, I'm vice president of the commission. Okay. <laughs> All right, other questions. Jim Rokakis, I think you had a question, but it didn't come through. 
You have to unmute yourself if you want to ask. No, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to make sure I saw some hands being raised. My Oberlin, my fellow Oberlin grad, I'm a class of 77. Oh, freshman. wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. Great to see you. <laughs> Well, we're going to have a chorus of the fight song at the end, right? So. Oh, I was going to say, we're getting inundated with all these Oberlin people. <laughs> the, the year I was a, a junior, we only had 17 people on the football team. And Tommy Smith, you remember him? He was the track coach. He was coming to racquetball classes and recruiting football players. Uh, I, I didn't offer my services, by the way. I get a, I get a lot of um, athletes in my classes, and I love it. I, I absolutely love it. They're fantastic. <laughs> Well, I've got a question. Yes, I have a couple, but I, I wanted to ask one the, about the whole thesis of your book, which um, I guess is alien to a person like me. Mm -hmm. But you talk about people who have been slaves mm -hmm. having to, and I think your word was reimagine themselves and then go on to become that person. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and maybe about the lady on the cover of your book who seems, I got a lecture on this from my wife earlier, but uh, <laughs> uh, seems to be a rather formidable person, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so would you just talk a little, maybe use her as an example of what, what that whole process may have been like. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the argument of my book that you know these women were imagining liberty even if we don't have a lot of evidence for that um, is about an issue with a, a, a challenge that I come up against in writing about enslaved and free black women and it's archival sources right they're not Thomas Jefferson they're not recording every detail of their life many of them are um, legally forbidden for, from learning how to read and write um, and so how do you begin to capture your life? And so I've had to look at um, documents that primarily see them as criminals or transgressors in order to get a sense of that, right? And so when I talk about Suki at, um, you know, in the beginning of this presentation, Suki, um, I find Suki in a fugitive slave ad, right? And a fugitive slave ad is, you know, someone's putting a, a, a reward, right, out to capture you. And so um, these people are seen as committing crimes of theft um, by escaping their slave owners, right? So I have to look at these records that aren't the, they're not nice, neat diaries or, you know, neatly organized papers and, you know, on Black women's theories of liberty, right? It's, it's you know, runaway advertisements or arrest records, right? Or, you know, evidence of them transgressing in some way. And when I looked at that advertisement, um, what struck me is that um, word got out that she started calling herself someone else, right? And that she started saying that her status was different, right? So she was like, I'm no longer Suri, my name is Suki, right? Um, I'm a free woman, right? And, and, and I'm, I'm just trying to hire out my, my services to you, right? So she is, you know, in a, in a split second now become someone completely different has now completely different legal and labor status in her, you know, in her presentation of herself. And to me, I found that really compelling because here you have a system of chattel slavery that has existed for centuries where increasingly over time, a scaffolding of laws were passed to increasingly circumscribe what life could be. You couldn't read, you couldn't fly a kite in DC. You couldn't be black and fly, fly a kite, which I still, I'm trying to figure out the logic behind that. But you couldn't play cards. Um, you couldn't gather in groups of larger than four, right? You couldn't be out um, past 10 o'clock unless you were at church, right? And so imagine every aspect of your life is controlled and surveyed in ways that really limit your existence, right? And so that that slave advertisement along with all of the other records that I looked at gave me a window into how Suki probably 20 years ago said that she was gonna change her name to Suki. She probably had plotted one day, I'm gonna just leave here, right? And she even, you know, in that in that description of her, I I show you an argument that she had with her mistress 
some years ago, some years prior, right to the escape where she says, I'm going to do what I want to do, right? I show that quote, you know, I'll do as I please. Um, and this is years before her, you know, the escape notice comes out, right? And so putting that piece together and the piece of the fugitive slave ad made me sort of think about, okay, if we were in her shoes, she was probably thinking about this for a while, right? And even if she never acted upon it, she was probably imagining a different existence, right? Because she saw people around her living more free than her. And I wanted to get at that. And, you know, and perhaps I got out of that, got at that in a really imperfect way, but I thought it was worth a conversation to have, right? Um, and so I'm sure I tell people that's an argument people are either going to love or they're going to hate, right? Um, and so um, fortunately, most people have appreciated kind of the possibilities of imagining all the different ways they sort of considered, you know, um, what was available to them. But then in, in, in the case of Alethea Tanner, how they imagine something even bigger, right? To start one's own institutions and to become a philanthropist, right? From a, from a small garden plot, right? Um, and so I think that um, it was really, I was really in my head when I was writing this and thinking about what the sources could tell us. Fascinating. Um, I've got another kind of tactical question, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Did you come across any information uh, regarding how people reacted to uh, both of Lee's offensives into the North? Because we know that um, slave hunters went with him. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that they were, they were enslaving people left and right on, on both mm -hmm. occasions. Did you find anything about any reactions to that uh, in, in, in your research? I didn't, but now I want to go look for it. Um, <laughs> so that's fascinating. What I, you know, because people were really concerned about the fact that Lincoln was really committed to making sure that he was making the loyal slaveholding states happy, right? And so um, the federal marshals were still detaining people who were violating the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, right, in Maryland, right, and helping Maryland find their slaves. And so many of the people on the ground, African Americans, were afraid, right, of those kinds of repercussions. Um, but I hadn't come across anything about, right, the threat of, of Lee's army invading, right, so close um, to the region. Um, but now I want to go look, I want to go look for that. I feel like that would be a wonderful article uh, to write. Um, because, you know, people watched the war very closely and newspapers were read aloud and people were very invested on the progress that the Union uh, military was making. I'm looking for other questions. Paul, Paul did you have a, are you raising your hand? Questions. Raise your hand or speak up, unmute yourself. We'll probably get this down about the time we do our last Zoom meeting. <laughs> That's how it always works, right? <laughs> right. How did you choose Keckley for your cover? And can you tell us a little bit about her working for both uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and Verena Davis? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my editors chose Keckley um, on the cover. And so <laughs> that I have very little autonomy. Um, but the cool thing is the map of DC is on the back of, in the background of the book. I don't know if you can see it. Um, my, the press sent this like giant uh, poster board here. That's, so we I can see that. <laughs> so, so there's a map um, on the back, um, in the background of Keckley's photo, um, which I thought was really cool. Um, so Keckley, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, was born enslaved um, and learned the trade of sewing high-end dresses for elite women. And um, by the time, um, you know, uh, she, you know, switched hands with different slaveholders um, under the ownership of other slaveholders, she was able to um, earn enough money to buy her freedom and buy the freedom of um, her son. Um, and so she moves to DC. Um, and she moves to DC because that's where all the elite political wives, right, 
in the nation are convening. And that's where, you know, the biggest social season of the nation, right, is going to be. It's going to be in the nation's capital when um, the men of Congress and Senate are conducting the business of the government. And so the wives, you know, accompany them and also have these um, social sets um, and need, you know, really nice clothing um, to, to wear. And so she um, is first, right, working with Verena Davis and with wives across um, a variety of different political spectrums, um, which I think is really fascinating, right? Um, she's very entrepreneurial. Um, she sets up her own shop. Um, she makes these very high-end dresses. Um, and she, when she writes her memoir um, about her life, um, she's very clear about her affinity to um, the Davis family and also to the Lincoln family, right? And she takes this kind of middle of the road approach, right? That um, these were still her clients. These were people with whom she had close ties with. And um, she becomes a, a public figure in her own right while in DC, particularly among African-Americans. And so she founded the Contraband Relief Society raised funds among those same group of elite wives um, to help assist with the needs of the refugees who were coming uh, to the Capitol. And so she leveraged her business network in order um, to create a, 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 a philanthropic network of, um, you know, to help refugees who were coming in um, to, uh, to DC. And so she is very, aware of what it means to have proximity to someone like uh, Verena Davis and, uh, and Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, and she writes this tell-all memoir behind the scenes um, where she talks about what her life was like as an enslaved woman um, and what it meant to purchase her own freedom and build her own business. Um, but she also you know, explains that she has this really intimate friendship um, with Mary Todd Lincoln and um, it causes quite a firestorm. People are not happy um, that she, they see it as um, core form for a black woman to create this level of proximity and familiarity um, with the nation's former president. Um, and so when she writes this, um, this memoir, it actually, rather than getting people really excited about, ooh, this is this tell all memoir, people are actually quite upset, right? Um, and so um, she's quite a personality, quite the socialite, um, very much a self-made woman um, and, and really makes her mark on the nation's capital. Question? Question, if I may? Yes, William. Uh, Professor, do you think Gloria Rubin's portrayal of Keckley in the movie Lincoln captured her personality or was true to the image you had of her? Um, you know, I thought that she was a little more, um, I thought she was a little more quiet than Keckley. You know, Keckley was, Keckley was a personality, right? In the way that you would expect a fashion designer to be, right? You know, <laughs> if you think about fashion designers today, right? There's a lot of ego and like self-possessiveness involved. And I think that, you know, the way she wrote her memoir, it really read <laughs> in, with similar tones. But I, I do know that she, she knew how to carry herself in these circles as well, right? And so she knew what it meant, the gravity of being in the White House, the gravity, right, of addressing the First Lady, you know, at such a transformative time in history. Um, and she was aware of that, right? And so I think that, you know, Gloria does a really nice job of navigating kind of the, the, the kind of finessing that Keckley has to do in that space. But it really would have been great to see her out of that element and in her element, right, at church and organizing among other women, because I think you would have saw a very different personality. I was just glad to see her in it at all. So I was <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this Kathleen, you know, and so she's like mysteriously walking by and I was like, oh, that's her. So <laughs> her one and only on screen portrayal. I can't think of another movie, Civil War era movie in which Keckley appears. Yeah. Other questions? We're gonna, we'll, we could play the Jeopardy theme music I see and maybe <laughs> comes up with a question. If not, we're gonna end with William Vaudrey's question, which I guess is inappropriate as an Oberlin alumnus to- I think I asked them all. Professor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you have one more? No, I think I asked them all, thank you. Okay. 
Oh, and we've got a note from Maynard. He says, Betty says that our speaker is currently competing with us on C-SPAN 3. So <laughs> for those who have that, be on the lookout, right? <laughs> you want to make any other self-promotion announcements of where you might be appearing for the rest of the group, OK? <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, there's stuff on C-SPAN. Um, I just did a really great interview with um, Mount Vernon, um, and, and that was really great. George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, that's on YouTube. And um, I'll be appearing with Martha Jones uh, for more women's history um, at Ford's Theater next, um, next Thursday. Um, and then I think I have a lot of talks that I just you know, just trying to get a handle on. So I think just, you know, continue to look through YouTube and you can find um, some of my talks. Some of them are interview style, some of them are lecture style, uh, tailored to the needs of each organization. But I just want to thank you all so much uh, for having me. I really appreciate your engagement with my work and, you know, for listening to me gab, you know, for that long, you know, thank you. I really appreciate it. And if you, um, if you want a signed book plate, um, I'm happy to send it to you. Just shoot me an email. Um, Steve, you can feel free to share my email. It's also public on um, Oberlin's website. Um, but just shoot me an email with your address and I'll, I'll sign it um, and, and have it sent to you. Um, but thank you all so much. Well, thank you very much. I want to. Even, I'm sorry, if I may, I did have one other point. It's not for Professor Nunley, who again I thank for coming to speak to us tonight. But I've been trying to get in touch with Roundtable member Kirk uh, Hinman, and mail I've sent to him has come back undeliverable, and uh, phone number his phone number is now not being answered. If anybody has had any contact with Kirk, who's quite elderly, as many of you know, let's say in the last two months, would you please get in touch with me? I'm just a little worried. Thank you. Thank you, William. And Rich, did you have your hand up? Yes, question for you. Do you uh, speak to uh, students at the elementary schools or are you, you know, just strictly at the college level? Um, right now I'm at the college level. I used to do some um, elementary school because my daughter's in elementary school. So her teachers finagled me in there. But, um, um, but lately um, I haven't been able um, to do it. And, and I've also kind of been questioning whether or not to do it because how would I do it with this book? Um, normally, if there's a curricular need, like around the Civil War, right. um, I'm, I'm happy to help. But with my book, because it's stuff about slavery and um, kind of harder topics, um, sometimes that's a little harder for me to... to well, the reason I brought it up is I'm the founder of Menlo Park Academy, which is a school for oh, gifted awesome. kids in Ohio. Yeah. And I could see our students uh, benefiting from some of your presentations because they just competed in National History Day and one of them oh, had the topic cool. on the Underground Railroad. Oh, awesome, awesome. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I, I, I go with Ken Grossi um, at the Oberlin College Archives. He's our archivist. And um, sometimes I accompany him. Um, okay. He talks about the Underground Railroad. He'll come and talk um, about the Underground Railroad and bring artifacts from the archives. Um, and sometimes I join him uh, uh, for that. And he's really great because he situates the Underground Railroad in our local context, right. which um, students really appreciate and enjoy. All right, well, I'll remember that for the fall because one of our teachers is also on this call. <laughs> oh, <awesome>. Yes, <laughs> Professor Nunley, can you give me the name of the archivist again? His oh. name is Ken, Ken uh, Grossi. Okay. Mm -hmm. G-R-O-S-S-I, and he's very responsive. I will reach out to him, and we would even love to have you come in as, as a Zoom presenter. It would be fantastic. Yeah, and, you know, normally us as a team, mm -hmm. you know, is, is really good because he has the artifacts, which is all the kids are really interested in. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. Will, I will uh, make contact. Thank you, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Ryan. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to thank all those guys from the roundtable who helped with the uh, National History Day judging on behalf for our for our school so on behalf of frank and i thank you for your time and your efforts for everybody it's all right rich yeah, thanks you again me, everybody you owe me at least a six pack for that that's okay. <laughs> thank you, oh you yeah. can let me know what what kind you like i'll get I'll okay take care i'm gonna of that i'm gonna cut what we call the west side militia off here these are all <laughs> muffins <laughs> it's it's a thank you very much for being with us uh, I posted my uh, email address, and if you if uh, send me information, if I'll forward you uh, contact information for Dr. Nunley, if you like, 
And uh, under Shameless Self-Promotion, again, you can order her book through our website. We have a website. Remember, guys, Cleveland Civil War Roundtable. And if you click on the link, you go to Amazon, you can buy her book. Send me uh, a request. I'll let you know her email address if you want the plate. And uh, remember, we're going to Petersburg. This is my shameless self-promotion here, too. So thank you all very much. And unless somebody else has something for the good of the order, I'm going to say good night. And we'll see y'all in April. And thank you again, Dr. Nunley. Thank a, you. Big grad, too. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everybody.